On the next Pioneers of Insight. Uh, I first of all became a storyteller by accident. Welcome to the stage, Stephanie Somerville. You know, I grew up in southern Indiana starting in the late 1960s. And during that time, it might as well have been 20 years before. You can never quit it was very much a Jim Crow kind of vibe. You got to keep the white the black. Pepper. They still had this old school antebellum South uh, hatred. Even there wasn't even a Southern gentility about it. In my hometown of Evansville, Indiana, they had to force integration the year that I went into kindergarten. Part of the concession was that the schools that were white said, "Okay." You can integrate, but we're not going to send a bus to come pick you up, so you have to take the city bus to do it. That energy, it was kind of like a shadow that hung over everything. Say look here, mister. Look here, mister. After I finish eighth grade, my father dies, and um, I was enrolled in this fundamentalist, all-white, Bible-beating with Arthur Dimsdale from the Scarlet Letter running the church, right? It's awful. I am labeled a Jezebel. They explained it to me that I was evil by default, and simply because I'm, an, I'm African-American, because Moses, had a black concubine and therefore he was punished and was not allowed to see the promised land. So I was not allowed to date. How are you keeping it together? No, I'm not. So that this is, I mean, I can pinpoint several times at this point already where my personality has fragmented, fragmented for lack of a better term. Fragmented. Created like several inner children. <laughs> so I am now, at 16, I was taking lithium and Valium. And that's when the sensitivity came in, where I had to be aware and start to observe my own behavior. So it wasn't until the late 80, or somewhere in the 90s, and that takes me to England, where I studied Shakespeare, and then to Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York and then I end up bouncing into New York. I'm acting, I, I started reading copy for the blind. So I went to work at an NPR affiliate that led to work at NBC and oh my God, crazy stressful. Meanwhile, that manic depressive bipolar pendulum is swinging, and I always knew that I only had like two and a half weeks where I would be planning for the days of lucidity and then mitigating what would happen next. So fast forward to Brooklyn, 2007. I'm telling these people about how I had to take care of a Klansman who was dying of cirrhosis. And when I showed up in his house, his wife did not know that I was black and I didn't know they were clans people. And we can make it known, we can make it hard down in the limelight. And the agency that sent me to their house was like, well, you have someone and you don't have anybody else. So and after I finished, this woman comes up to me and she says, How would you like to tell this story to a room full of strangers on a stage? And I thought to myself, it's like what? <laughs> One day, this man at a mega church saw my thing on YouTube, and he said, I am doing a whole series for my church, my very rich constituents at my mega church, on racial reconciliation. Can you come tell your story? So, that's where I was. They called me in. I felt almost kind of like maybe the way Christ must have felt, you know, when people would come up to him. They just wanted to, like, somehow connect. And in that moment, I realized that I am... I am, I am, I am.